organizers for this nice event, and I hope that we will have a fruitful discussion after my talk. So uh, today, uh, before I start about proving code equivalence, I will uh, first say a few words about me. And um, first, I'm. My name is Milena, and I'm associate professor at the Department for Computer Science at the Faculty of Mathematics, University of Belgrade, and I also work part-time as a principal researcher at Oracle Labs. Uh, my research interests include software analysis, optimization, and verification. Uh, today, I chose uh, to talk about the joint work with my ex-PhD student. Uh, he's ex because he defended his PhD recently, so. <laughs> So he is now my colleague, not anymore a PhD student. Um, so uh, this is uh, about uh, uh, solving the Sparkle query containment problem um, with a tool that we built together. Uh, this is a journal paper that we submitted to the Journal of Web Semantics, and we are hoping each day that we would get the response because the first round of reviews went well, so now we are waiting for this second round of reviews. So each morning I first check what happens there, and then I continue with working. And I was hoping that until I come here, I, I could be able to say, okay, it is accepted, but unfortunately, still not. And uh, this is uh, connected to this second paper that we also published in our Springer Journal, Software Co Quality Journal, um, Verification Supported Refactoring of Embedded SQL. Um, actually, uh, this second paper uh, is naturally follows the first that we did not uh, publish yet, but for some reason we started in the opposite direction. So we first grabbed the mm, more difficult problem. We learned a lot from it, and then uh, after we published that and got the results, then we came back and worked on this first problem. But uh, today I will talk in the right direction, not in the way that we worked, worked on this. And yeah, so uh, let me start first about query containment problem and about Sparkle uh, language. So this is just an introduction, and what I will try to do is just to give you the ideas of the problems, uh, to spot some difficulties that we had while we were developing this, and to give you some ideas of our results. And without any technical details, so if someone is interested in the technical details, I will be very glad uh, to discuss it offline. So, uh, the query containment problem is a problem of deciding if each result of one query is also a result of another query. And uh, this is a fundamental problem in data management introduced already 50 years ago. So, um, it is an important problem, and as all important problems, it is undecidable. But, <laughs> uh, of course, there are some fragments that are decidable, unfortunately, and be complete. So, um, there, there is a room for investigating um, here, and a lot of work actually was done um, on this problem in um, SQL. So the SQL uh, is a long-lasting language, and this was first formulated within SQL. Um, why is this problem important? It is important especially for global query optimizations and the static analysis and many other important problems like uh, query equivalence and query satisfiability can be reduced to a uh, query containment problem. So uh, this is the core problem uh, in data management. And Sparkle is a relatively new programming language. It's a programming language for semantic web. Uh, what is the main idea of semantic web? Uh, it is making internet data machine readable so that uh, machines can extract information from data. Um, so within semantic web, the most important is a resource description framework, which uh, gives a framework for defining relationship between data objects, so that uh, we have a da uh, data model for metadata, and this metadata should be readable for machines so that machines can extract information from data. And there is a really growing amount of uh, data in this resource description framework, and Sparkle is a query language for this framework. So it enables users to query information from databases or other data sources that can be mapped to this framework. 
So how this looks like? This might be look complicated, but actually I will try to explain. These are um, triples. So you can see in each line you have subject, predicate, and object. So the subject here is Bob Marley. Predicates, we have different predicates and different objects. We have here Bob Marley is, uh, has uh, as a birthplace uh, has Jamaica. And uh, first the type he's a person. Similarly here we have some information about Jamaica and it is a type of country and uh, we have here additional how it is uh, written in different languages and where is the home page of the country. And usually uh, this is actually presented as graphs. So you have here Bob Marley and then dif different connections, these um, relationships, these predicates are on edges of the graphs. And here we have these objects and uh, you, you can see uh, he was born on Jamaica. We have Jamaica here, so this is uh, somehow connected. And uh, I think it's naturally actually connected and uh, if it's shown with graphs. And you can imagine that you can have a lot of data and a lot of connections here. So uh, what is uh, one query? This is a query that extracts data about music musicians from Jamaica. How do we write a query? Uh, we select name, surname, birthday, uh, and that day it's optional if the um, musician is dead. And we say here, we select this, and then we say the connections with, between different variables. So um, we say this is a type of person, and that person is music, musical artist. And here we can say that the place we connected that this is the birthplace, that this place is Jamaica. Okay, so this is a kind of query. And uh, if, um, if we look at the, the result of this query, uh, okay, this is the result of the query. It is a set of mappings which maps each uh, this variable with some concrete value. So we have different uh, mappings for each result that we can get from, the, from our database. Um, so uh, more precisely, um, this is very simplified Sparkle syntax because Sparkle is a real world uh, language, so it's not, uh, not a simple toy language. This is very simplified, but uh, you can see here it is pretty much similar to SQL. We, you have select some variables from, you can specify data where you want to select it from, and where you give some conditions that should hold on these variables so that you extract this data. And here um, you have these patterns uh, that uh, specify different operators. So we have union minus dot that corresponds to and, and so on. Uh, so now we can define query containment problem uh, a little bit uh, more precise. Uh, hopefully you understood the intuition about this querying. So um, we uh, set of solution mappings. We no note we have this notation for set of solution mappings. And Q1 is contained in Q2 if this property holds, if this set of solution mappings of uh, Q1 uh, is a subset of set of solution mappings of Q2, and if that holds for every RDF data set G. And this is the notation for, uh, for this relationship. Q1 is a subquery, uh, Q2 is a superquery, and the problem is for given two queries, determine whether the first is contained uh, within the second query. Um, and here is a simple example of two queries that are in this relationship. So in the first query, we select information about undergraduate students that take some course, but in this first query, we say we want that student to have information about email and phone, and in the second, we just ask for email. So it is obvious that uh, persons who have email and for phone are a subset of the persons that have um, email. Okay, so this is uh, 
this is a kind of, this is an example of queries within this relationship. And here, uh, there is also, in addition to queries, there can be RDF scheme that constrains the interpretation of graphs. So if you look now at these two queries, we have uh, in the first query some restriction that someone is male head of or female head of something. And uh, in the second, uh, we have uh, that, uh, that we select someone who is a professor. So it looks like it is not connected at all and that there is no subquery, superquery connection between two queries, these two queries. But here, if we look about this scheme, this uh, scheme shows that a male head off is a kind of head off and female head off is also kind of head off and head off is, uh, uh, must be a full professor and full professor is a kind of professor. So if you put everything that together, you can find out that actually this first query is a subset uh, of the second one. So these uh, schemes, when they are present, they also have to ta be taken into account. So this is the framework, uh, the idea, the problem that we were solving. And here is the overview of the architecture that we proposed. So uh, we start with uh, two queries and uh, we consider some relationship between two these two queries and then build different formulas in first order logic and send these formulas to an SMT solver to obtain the result. If RDF scheme is present, then we also have to add some uh, axioms that are modeling this uh, scheme and then together this formula and these axioms are uh, going into SMT solver. So, uh, I will say a few words now about this part here, but it was like a lot of work, so it cannot be summarized quickly, but um, transforming the Sparkle query into a full formula um, subsumes transforming a graph pattern that were closed, that you see recursively into a formula that we named phi, but it is uh, for first order logic formula. And uh, so sparkle terms are transformed into corresponding variables and constants. There we introduce some um, uninterpreted predicates, and then we also um, model each operator that you have seen there on that, um, on that um, syntax like minus, union, and so on, we model them according to sparkle semantics. So uh, this is one slide, but it is a huge amount of work um, because modeling must, must precisely follow sparkle semantics. And what we wanted to make was uh, uh, to make a model that is both sound and complete. So uh, aside, we were doing the modeling and then we were also proving soundness and completeness of our approach. So uh, each time when we could not prove something, we just realized that we did something wrong in the modeling. So we went back, one step back, and tried to understand and find what, what we did wrong and how to change it to, uh, so that we can um, make uh, our approach uh, sound and complete. So um, here, um, I just wanted to say like this, uh, this tilde relationship, um, uh, it, is, uh, it connects relevant variables, the chosen variables of these queries. They must be equal according to definition of equivalent sparkle queries. And then we have these two formulas, uh, theta and psi. Uh, the second one actually models that something is a subquery of something else uh, in its real form. But the first one uh, actually is necessary. That is something that, for example, we learned while we were not able to prove uh, soundness and completeness. Actually, you cannot forget the, that uh, each um, unsatisfiable query, which has as a result an empty set, is a subquery of any other query. So uh, we had to model that. So this first actually captures this unsatisfiability. So if we get back, uh, we, uh, if we have the same relevant queries, we go to check uh, this complete formula. If not, we just check for unsatisfiability. And concerning these axioms, uh, I just 
listed them here. Um, I'm not going to explain them, just to you know, for you to take a look how that looks like. These are simple and they follow the semantics of the axioms that of the semantics of the RDF scheme that is um, given within Spark. Um, what I was talking until now were uh, conjunctive queries and. Um, uh, if we want to deal with non-conjuncting queries, then we first have uh, to introduce some additional uh, restrictions and then also to eliminate uh, sub-queries, operator optional in the union. There are some, um, let's say, standard procedures for doing that. So if we start with, an, with a query that is not a conjunctive query, then we first uh, eliminate uh, sub-queries, then eliminate optional, and finally uh, we process union so that we can, um, we get many, uh, let's say many queries, uh, sub-queries that we have to, to check. And, <coughs> excuse me, um, so this is the way we, uh, for more complex uh, queries, how to reduce and how to, to put it to that previous framework. So, uh, we implemented everything in C++. Uh, we generate uh, query-based con uh, containment conditions in SMTlib format uh, so that we can use different uh, theorem provers and solvers. Uh, the tool is open source and available, and um, we, uh, we compare it to other available state-of-the-art solvers. There are five of them. To, uh, based on me calculus and two on tree algebra. And this last one is not actually the query containment solver, it is, but it can be used for query equivalence. So we also did the comparison with, between this last one. So um, if we take a look um, on uh, Sparkle language constructs and the types of queries that's, that our tool can manage, you can see that all check marks are here, and for each other tool, some check mark is missing. So we are very proud of that, that we managed to, to have all the check marks. And um, we did the evaluation on benchmarks that are standard benchmarks. There are two benchmarks for, um, for compa comparing um, the efficiency of uh, query containment solvers. First one is uh, uh, handcrafted and has only 76 test cases, but very different test cases that capture different uh, things. And the other one is the most important one is a framework uh, that, uh, that generates opti uh, customized Sparkle query containment benchmarks based on real Sparkle query logs, so like uh, real uh, examples, not uh, handcrafted, and this one contains almost um, 800 of test cases. So uh, we use these two benchmark, and as a side result, uh, we identified incorrect test cases within both benchmarks. So uh, the test cases that were classified like this is a uh, this the query containment uh, relation holds, but it doesn't hold, or vice versa. And uh, we manually checked all these test cases, confirmed, fixed. We also sent that to the maintainers of these benchmarks. Everything is confirmed. So this resulted in a better and more reliable benchmarks. And um, concerning some uh, summarized evaluation. On the left side uh, is the percentage of successfully solved test cases per solver. So uh, the bigger is the better, okay? Uh, so the green one is for our tool, and uh, this is for the first and this is for the second benchmark. And on the right side is the average solving times um, in milliseconds per solver, and this second one, the smaller is the better. So again, we are green, and as you can see, we are really good, except in this case where this tool is uh, slightly better, but as you can see, this tool uh, cannot solve anything else except in this class of problems. So uh, this, sorry? Which solver did you use for this? Uh, we used uh, Z3, the Z3. We tried different ones, and with Z3 get, uh, got the best results. So, um, so to conclude this, uh, this 
um, this part of the talk. Detailed results and discussion, of course, um, are available in the paper. Hopefully, paper will be uh, <laughs> online soon. Um, and uh, so the evaluation shows the specs is highly efficient, and compared to the other state of the art solver, it gave, gives more precise results in a shorter amount of time, and that it also has the highest coverage of the supported language constructs. Uh, we have manually proved soundness and completeness of the proposed approach for conjunctive queries, and we are planning to do that formally uh, within a proof assistant. That is a huge work, of course, but that is something um, that we were already discussing and that we would like to do. Uh, the proofs that we have already done manually, uh, we um, are very detailed, so when uh, our colleague uh, who will do this uh, proving within a proof assistant with us. When he read this proof, he said, this is almost like you, you already, you, you covered everything, uh, all the cases and all the corner cases. So like you, you, you thought about everything. I'm sure that there will be something that will arise. Of course, uh, some cases that we did not consider, but hopefully we will work on that, on that soon. And yeah, that is about this first uh, first talk. And now I'm moving to our first work, but that is naturally uh, spoken ab uh, after this one. So uh, what we wanted actually to do is to do something for SQL. And SQL is so well studied and query containment problem and everything is already done a billion of times in SQL. So uh, we started with that and tried to find the room for uh, for our, um, let's say, for doing something in this field. And then we realized that there is a number of approaches for dealing with equivalence of uh, either pairs of imperative code fragments or pairs of SQL uh, statements. But usually, uh, database-driven applications have uh, both together, both imperative code and then you have uh, some um, SQL statements inside. And then you, when you have database-driven application, you have simultaneous changes, changes that include both SQL and the host language code. And uh, such changes can preserve the overall equivalence without preserving the equivalence of these two parts considered separately. So uh, that is something actually that no one else considered uh, before us, and it's really a difficult problem. And we, what we propose is uh, an automated approach for dealing with the equivalence of programs after such changes. Uh, so as an example, so that you understand better what I'm talking about here, two, two small, simple functions, uh, they are not important what they are doing, but here you can see you select some variables and then you subtract the values of these variables within the SQL within the select clause of the of this code, and then you return what you selected. And here you select two variables and then subtract it here within the host language. So if you consider these two SQL uh, SQL queries, they are not equivalent. If you consider just these two functions, the imperative parts, they are not equivalent. But if you consider them together, these two functions are equivalent. So uh, that was the topic that we worked on. And uh, we propose an axiom-based semantics uh, for SQL queries that can be linked with semantics on the imperative programs and used for automated reasoning about functional equivalence um, of SQL-based functions. And uh, uh, this, uh, this approach uh, generates equivalence condition that can again be efficiently checked by using S and T solvers and first uh, order logic provers. So uh, here, like the, uh, the previous time also, the biggest uh, problem was how to translate the code into the formula. Um, and so here we have uh, first the split of code into two intermediate representation. First is SQL part, the second is imperative part. Then we bit, build formulas for both parts, and then we merge this formula, merge these formulas into one formula that describes the overall code. So for doing this, we use the tool Love. Uh, this is a, 
uh, LVM automated verifier, um, which uh, is based on model checking and symbolic execution, and that can give us a formula in first order logic. Uh, the tool was uh, slightly improved and upgraded for this purpose, and this second part for transforming SQL into fall uh, was completely written uh, for this purpose. Um, when we make descriptions of two codes, we get two formulas, then as equivalence should hold when inputs are the same, we connect inputs of these two formulas, and then there we make different equivalence condition that we check one by a one by an SMT solver. Um, these equivalence condition, so, uh, are different depending of the queries that we have on input, and there are several conditions so that if one holds, then we check another, if the another calls, then we check the third one, and so on, and if we cannot prove something, we know where we stopped and why we stopped, and that uh, can uh, be given as a, um, a, as a feedback to the user so that uh, he or she can know what happens and why the equivalence uh, was not proved. So here again we have uh, implemented the tool, it is publicly available, also open source. Uh, formulas are generated in snt format. We again experimented with Z3 and Vampire and some different solvers but choose Z3 for our evaluation. And for usability reasons, we also implemented GitHub Actions so that you, uh, in use case, when you change something and then commit something and so on, that this can be easily, um, easily applied. Concerning evaluation, no standard benchmarks available, no other tools dealing with this problem. So we were the first that to tackle this problem, so we, we had to make a benchmark, and uh, it was not easy. Uh, we made a benchmark consisting of 280 test cases for uh, evaluating our tool. Uh, the benchmarks uh, contains uh, different SQL constructs, different interactions with the host language, and uh, we wanted to assess the efficiency of our tool and preciseness of the proposed approach with these benchmarks and evaluation shows that the proposed approach can be efficiently used in many different contexts. Uh, details and discussion can be found in the paper. Um, and also the approach gives useful hints in cases where equivalence is not proved. Uh, I was talking that within Sparkle we proved soundness, completeness, and so on. Here we did not prove anything. So um, the presented approach is not complete. We are aware of that um, because uh, we know that some things we did not model precisely. But still, it contains relevant information for proving a number of important cases of equivalence. So hopefully, it can be useful. Um, we are confident that it is sound. This confidence relies on relatively simple and intuitively acceptable axiom schemes and also the fact that not all our goals are proved, uh, but some goals are rejected. So, uh, and these that were proved were supposed to be proved and these that were rejected were supposed to be rejected. So uh, we have to work on this further, but um, and what was difficult in this context that in many aspects the consider problem is naturally expressed in terms of higher order logic and uh, then in terms of fall. But we made a big effort to perform all automated reasoning within fall uh, in order to use efficient available fall provers and SMT solvers. So uh, there. This is, this is something uh, that we were aware, but we wanted to stay in first order logic because of the efficiency. And to conclude, everything, uh, these first tools for Sparkle has excellent results uh, compared to other state of the art uh, query containment solvers and as of uh, further work, we want to prove soundness and completeness within a proof assistant and we also want to consider Sparkle within a host language. So to consider this uh, other topic that we considered for SQL, 
to consider it also uh, with, for Sparkle. And uh, as we were the first to tackle the important problem of connecting semantics of SQL with semantics of imperative host language, uh, we uh, build a big benchmark as a starting point for further comparison and evaluation. And uh, we, are also, uh, we are also thinking about proving what can be proved in this context. It's very hard and difficult, I, I cannot promise anything in, in this context. But we also think for adding support for automated generation of test cases uh, from the model given by an SMT solver so that the user can get a test case that will, uh, that will show better what, um, what happens and why there is no proven equivalence in that case. So that's it, thank you. I tried to be high level, but I, <laughs> I did confuse you all. These kind of statements we model by axioms. So we add these axioms. I will. We add these axioms that can be uh, this. Okay. So these are axioms that are modeling. Uh, that are modeling, for example, maybe. Let me see where is the subclass. This is something that is maybe um, the easiest uh, to explain. So uh, subclass is here. So we say if we have a triple C1 that is a, uh, that is a subclass of C2, um, and then there is a, a property that is, this is a property that say something like um, every person is a professor. So that is a specific property. So if we have the, these two holes, then we can conclude that this S is also the member of this uh, subclass here. So if we uh, superclass, this is subclass, this is superclass. So if this is an instance of the class one, then it is also the instance of the class two. So uh, we, if we have a scheme, we add for each enter uh, everything that is entered within a scheme and a relevant axiom saying this. So yeah, so everything, they Um, there are not many, like uh, there are not many examples within this, uh, these uh, benchmarks with uh, this scheme. Uh, so uh, we, uh, these examples, uh, we use these benchmarks. They reflect real world usage. So there is not much about this. So if you take a look at this, and if you think, okay, if I have everything of this and put everything inside, it will work forever. But actually, you do not have so much of that. So you do not put too much of that into SMT solver, so it is very efficient. So you do not really need something more efficient. How do you relate this um, uh, to query questions to um, automatic in uh, data automatically in graph database? Uh, Subquery question is. Uh, important because if we have subqueries, then we do not always stay in decidable part uh, of uh, problems. So there are some additional uh, restrictions that have to be put into, uh, if we have subqueries, then we have to have some relationship uh, between uh, the the queried variables and so on. Now I, I'm not sure about details, I, I can take a look, but there are some additional restrictions that have to pe be put on the queries so that you can reason about them and that you can uh, 
you can have some uh, results. Uh, without these restrictions, uh, you cannot talk much about it. There are some well-designed patterns that uh, are defined and then um, what you, you have to query, like you have to sub-query some variables and th there are these restric restrictions, I don't know them at this moment at all, but there are. Uh, we use uh, Isabel uh, at home, so uh, we are. If we do the formalizing, we will probably uh, do it in Isabel because we have the most experience with it, and the most people that have experience with it. Okay. Yes. It's pretty uh, much a new language, yeah. Yeah. Um, so I was going to ask, okay, now you've done all this work for Sparkle, so how about um, like uh, embedding Sparkle into higher like language and then doing the combination the same as you did for SQL? So maybe I'll just ask for your best guess or your intuition. Do the ideas from the from doing it for SQL will they translate to Sparkle? Do you see any immediate issues, or is it just really future work? This work with the SQL was really hard and we tried something and then we couldn't do it and when, then we tried something else and we couldn't do it and then we tried something more and then we couldn't do it and it, is, it was like we realized why nobody else did that before <laughs> because it, it was really, really very difficult. So uh, we did something useful, we did a lot of work there, it is efficient, it can be used, but uh, you have some natural limitations there and the natural limitation is that um, it is naturally modeled with higher order logic and you want to put it into first order logic. So that makes things difficult. And um, I see that limit <laughs> for Sparkle again because Sparkle is very similar to SQL. It was inspired to see with SQL and many things are similar. So we have experience, we know that we can do something in that field, but we are aware that we cannot do everything there. Mm -hmm. We can make some steps. We can actually, we can make things useful. Mm -hmm. Maybe that is enough. You cannot cover <coughs> everything. You cannot uh, solve all the problems, but you can make things useful to the end user. So that, that is something I think is worth working on. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you.